message from God's Word. Here is Damon Albert. Hey guys, so in this episode of Impart Revival Minute, I want to talk to you about breaking chains. Breaking chains. Psalms 107 verse 14 says, He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. This is clearly a reference to the work of Jesus. And I want to make a distinction here between the several sections of the statement. And the first is is that he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. So there's several things that are being stated here that Jesus did. I want to tell you that when Jesus invades a life, when he comes into a heart, when he comes into a situation, when he moves into a circumstance, when his word comes in and his presence comes in, and when Jesus is introduced to any scene, it's not only to bring that individual out of darkness and out of their sin, It's not only to remove the veil of deception that's on their eyes because, you know, the Bible says that that unless the Spirit of God draws, no one can come. So, like, if you're in a spot prior to the Spirit of God drawing you, prior to being introduced to the Lord and having that moment where Jesus gets a hold of you and you begin to see things in a different perspective, then you're seeing things wrong. You have a veil. You have a veil of sin. You have a veil of self. You have these things that are clouding your perception. But when Jesus invades a situation, he takes you out of that darkness and he makes you see things differently. He changes your perception. But this scripture here, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces, is not only talking about that concept of when you your eyes are opened up and you no longer are in the darkness, but you begin to look and see into the light. It's also not talking about just being delivered from the shadow of death. Because listen to the word, he brought them out of darkness, that's one part, and the shadow of death, okay? Well, how many people know the Bible says that we're all condemned to die? It, it, if the wages of sin is death, and we've all sinned, and we all um, will have to, to reap the consequence of that because the wages of sin is death. That means that when you sin, the end result is death. Now, you might not die right away. Now, you may go out there and sin, and it may be an instantaneous thing. We see this with uh, drug addicts sometimes and people that make a sinful decision, and they reap the consequence of that right away. But irregardless, if it happens right away, or you just live in sin, without the work of Jesus on the cross, the wages and the penalty and the payment due for that life of sin is death. But he brought them out of darkness. He brought them out of the shadow of death. So so what Jesus did is, through his work, he conquered not only sin, but he also conquered that death. That's what happened when he went and he was in the grave for three days. And then when he rose again, he got the keys to hell and death. So he conquered and he overcame death. Therefore, The Bible says when we die, we're absent from the body. We're present with the Lord. So technically, we escape death. Not that we don't physically die, but the wages and the consequence of eternal death and separation from God doesn't apply to us anymore because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Our faith in Him allows us the ability to, to conquer the sting of death. That's why the scripture says, Oh, death, where is your sting? It's lost the bite that it once had before Jesus entered our life. 
But the important part of this scripture that I want to talk to is not the part where he brings us out of darkness. It's not the part where he's overcome the shadow of death, but it's this last section. He broke their chains in pieces. He broke their chains in pieces. Now, it, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to go through the Bible and study uh, what it was like in the times of Jesus. I mean, you can read the Gospels and you can read uh, how he interacted with people and what he did with the people, the culture, and, and just what happened as he was walking and living on earth for the time period that he was here. It's well documented. And the thing that I want to point out is that the overwhelming factor of what happens when Jesus steps into the scene is that immediately things change. If Jesus comes into the room, things change. If someone's brought into the presence of Jesus, circumstances change. Chains that bound people, sicknesses that had held people down, sin and demons and things that had, had kept people under bondage when, when they're brought into the presence of the Lord or when Jesus invades that scene and that situation, those chains are gone. They're shattered. They're destroyed into a thousand million little pieces. Think about what happened what we know that happened when Jesus was around. So what's the first miracle we see? Jesus is at the wedding, right? The wedding party, they run out of wine. So there's some water there. So what's Jesus do? He goes ahead and he turns the water into wine. So there's a situation of physical change that took place that was just, it, it destroyed anything that had been done before. I mean, who else ever even heard about taking water and turning it into wine? Jesus comes in and bam. This is what he does. He, he immediately impacts the circumstance and the situation around him. Jesus, may, he, the next miracle, he's made aware about this nobleman's son who's sick. And bam, Jesus is in the situation and the nobleman's son is healed. So Jesus comes along a demon-possessed guy. This guy's being tormented by demons and he's out and he's cutting himself and he's going through all this pain and this suffering and Jesus comes on the scene and he destroys that chain. He casts the demons out. What's he do with Peter's mother-in-law? Peter's mother-in-law is under the chain of sickness and bondage. But when Jesus steps onto the scene... That bondage, that chain, that sickness is destroyed. What's he do even night so the disciples are out there having a terrible day fishing? Now, I like to fish, um, and I've had some pretty terrible days fishing. But the disciples are out there having a terrible day fishing, can't catch anything, and Jesus steps on the scene and immediately says, oh, cast your nets over here, and bam, it's the biggest catch they've ever had. Why? Because when Jesus steps into a situation... It's not just to bring light, but it's to radically change that situation. Jesus is, is, uh, uh, runs into this guy with leprosy. It's one of the worst diseases of the day. Nobody can, can cure it. What do we do? We send the leper out to the end of the, the community where he can't affect anybody else. And this guy's out there and he's uh, in isolation and doctors can't help him and people can't help him. But when Jesus steps Onto the scene in the leper's life, the problem immediately changes. What's he do with the centurion's paralyzed servant? Same thing. The servant is paralyzed. Jesus comes in. He destroys the chains of sickness and he heals him. We can keep going. The, the, the cripple is lower down through the roof. Okay, his friends cut through the roof, they break through the roof, they lower him down, and what happens? The guy is exposed to Jesus, and Jesus instantly heals the guy. Okay, uh, they're going through a storm. The disciples are out on the water, and there's a storm, and there's winds, and there are waves. But because Jesus is involved, he stands up, he speaks to the storm, he says, peace be still. He controls the wind, he controls the waves, and immediately the circumstance and the situation changes because Jesus is involved in that situation. What happens with Jairus' daughter? She dies. 
Okay, so death has come in, but then yet again, Jesus comes into that situation and raises her back to life. A blind man, a couple blind men, they're going through their life. They can't see. Their vision is gone. Some of them, they're gone since birth. And what happens? Jesus invades a situation, and all of a sudden, they're able to see like they've never seen before. Their eyes are open. You know, the man can't speak from birth. What's Jesus do? He impacts that situation. The chain of death and dumbness is gone, and, and now he's talking fine. A woman has an issue with blood, 38 years. Doctors can't help her. Um, you know, the, the internet can't help her. Um, you know, her friends can't help her. She's tried everything. She's, she's tried multivitamins. She's tried a, a new spa technique where you're floating, I heard about. I mean, she's trying all this different stuff. She's tried, um, you know, incense. She's tried natural herbs. She just can't get this to stop. Nobody can help her. But what's Jesus do? Jesus comes in and he changes the situation so there's 5,000 people over for dinner and then 4,000 people over for dinner and and we don't have enough food so Jesus just you know takes a couple fish fillets and some garlic toast and bam he, he feeds everybody out of it and the point I'm trying to get you to see here is that when Jesus comes into a situation, it's not just to, it, to bring light or shed some head knowledge or to, to shed some information. It's not just about conquering sin and death, but it's about Jesus on a practical level changing the circumstance and situation of whatever area that he invades. I mean, think about it. They, they, the disciples owe taxes. Okay, we're in we're in April right now, so people thinking about taxes. I'm sure there's people out there that are worried, man, I don't have the money for taxes. So Jesus comes into that situation. He says, hey, by the way, in that fish's mouth, you'll find the coin that we need to go and pay these taxes. You know, and then what about Lazarus? Lazarus is in the, the, the grave for three days. You know, uh, the people were like, hey, he stinks by now, Jesus. You know what I mean? He's been in there a while. But Jesus comes in and immediately he invades that situation of death and things change. The truth is, I don't see any example in scripture at all where Jesus steps into the scene or where somebody is exposed to Jesus and there isn't some sort of radical change that takes place in their life. I don't see any place where Jesus is involved or welcome to come into a situation or he walks into a situation or he finds himself in with people or a group or a circumstance where something radically isn't affected. Not just pie in the sky spiritually, but physically altered and changed. I actually think one of the greatest examples of a genuine encounter with Jesus is got to be a changed life. Hear that again. I, I think that one of the greatest evidences of a genuine encounter with Jesus is a changed life. You know, I have to question people who say that uh, they know Jesus and they have a relationship with Jesus and they're a Christian and or they've had an encounter with Jesus, but they have no evidence that they've ever been with Jesus. There's nothing that, that shows that they've been with Jesus. There's a passage in scripture there where the disciples out there preaching and teaching the gospel and, and the Bible says they're turning the world upside down and the local officials and the government, it says that they took note that they had been with Jesus. That means when they were with Jesus and they had been with Jesus, it produced a change in the circumstance. There was evidence that these people had been with Jesus. Let me give you another scripture to think about, and that's John 8, verse 36. And it says, So if the Son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. Again, that's John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let me tell you guys what doesn't break chains. Religion doesn't break chains chains. Church attendance doesn't break chains. Doing outwardly Christian stuff 
doesn't break chains. It's Jesus and his power and through his word and his spirit and his presence, when Jesus invades a situation, chains are broken. Now, if you've been exposed even once to the real Jesus, I promise you, you're going to come away changed. Now, maybe you're sitting here and you're listening uh, to this right now, and, and the only thing that you know about Jesus is that he saved you from sin. Maybe the only part of Jesus that you know is that, okay, so Jesus saved me out of darkness. Like I, he rescued me from hell. I once was lost, but now I'm found. But, you know, I was blind, but now I see. And that's where you're at. You just are looking at him as um, the, the savior of your soul and the one that has rescued you from the consequence of sin. But friends, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to tell you that the same Jesus that healed the woman with the issue of blood is the same Jesus that is as living and able to come in and intervene in your circumstance and your situation today. It's the same Jesus that delivered uh, those people that were bound by the demonic uh, forces that would be able to come in and intervene and bring deliverance in your life now and to bring freedom in your life now. If you're sitting here and you're you're bound in pornography or you're bound in lust or you're bound in narcotics or you're bound by alcohol or you're bound by, um, uh, you know, you have a food addiction or you have a, a drug addiction or you're, you're bound in confusion and fear. Maybe fear has got you gripped and where you, you can't do anything. Maybe the whole COVID situation has got you in so much fear and anxiety and stress stress. Maybe you're bound by, um, um, you know, uh, you know, oppression and, and um, worry and doubt. Well, I'm going to tell you the same Jesus that brought deliverance to everyone that you read about in the scripture is the same Jesus that can intervene in your situation today. He didn't come just to deliver you from darkness and save you from hell. He came to bust and destroy those chains of bondage in your life. Maybe um, you're in a situation where um, you know you have a lack, you you have a debt that you have to pay. Maybe uh, you don't know where your next meal's coming from. You don't know where your next uh, uh, dinner's coming. How you're gonna uh, provide for your children next week or feed your children next week? The same God and the same Jesus that multiplied the loaves and the fishes and fed four thousand and fed five thousand is the same God that can move in your life and change the the physical circumstance, even today, even tonight, even this week, you know, we talk about taxes, the same God who, who provided money in a fish's mouth for the disciples to pay their taxes is the same God who's alive today and able to provide and meet that need for you. Maybe you don't have the money to pay your taxes. Well, the same Jesus is in control and able to intervene in your situation and move. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you're out there and you, you, you're a fisherman, you had a bad uh, spell at fishing, you ain't caught any fish. Well, it's the same Jesus. He's able to come and intervene and move in your life. Maybe you have areas of your life that are dead, like Lazarus. He was in the grave for three days. And then Jesus came in and all of a sudden he, he resurrects with resurrection, life, and power, he brings him back from the dead. Maybe there's areas in relationships. Maybe there's areas uh, of, of death in your life. And maybe Jesus wants to bring his resurrection power and life into those situations. He didn't come just to save you. He came to destroy the works of darkness. I want to tell you guys, if you're listening to this right now, I want to just speak life over you. I want to declare the word of God over your life. The awesome thing about the word of God is, is that the Bible says that the word of God is the living word. It's Jesus 
in the word. The word become flesh. Jesus and the word is the same thing. So when we declare the word of God and we profess and we confess and we claim and we speak the word of God into physical circumstances, it's like Jesus invading those circumstances and invading those situations. And what I want to do is I want to speak even right now. If one of those things I listed, maybe you're wrestling with uh, sickness in your life. Maybe you have fear. Maybe you have anxiety. Maybe you have debt or lack. You just have an area where you need the power and presence of God. You need Jesus to invade that area of your life and that area and that circumstance. Well, I want to speak faith into that circumstance. I want to declare that he didn't come just to save your soul, but he came to destroy that sin that has you captive. Even now, if you're sitting there and you know you're bound in an addiction, you're bound to lust, you're bound to pride, you're, you're, you're stealing from your employer, whatever it is that's got you in bondage, I just want to speak by the name of Jesus and by the power of his spirit that deliverance would come to you. Maybe you're there and you're sick in your body and you've been diagnosed with COVID. Maybe you've been diagnosed with cancer. Maybe you've been diagnosed with heart disease or a heart murmur or a tumor in your body. Well, I'm telling you that the word of God, its the Bible says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to do and penetrate. It's able to do a work in our heart, in our mind, in our life. It's able to separate and divide things. It's able to do surgery in the hearts and minds of men. And I'm telling you the word of God is able to go in and hit that tumor and destroy that tumor. The word of God is able to go in and 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 take that COVID and take that uh, cancer and take that um, uh, diagnosis of men and the word of God is able to just destroy those things. I've seen it over and over and over again. And I just want to declare if you're sick in your body, even right now, I just want to declare God's healing over you. That by his blood and by his stripes, not only were you uh, set free from sin, but by his blood and his stripes, you can receive healing in him. I, I want to declare his word that says that he is a God who heals. Maybe you have an area of lack and you need a, a need in your life met. I want to declare the word of God over you that says he is El Shaddai. He's the God who's more than enough. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's the God who can provide. He's the God who can meet that need. And I'm telling you, I'm not just saying these things to say these things. I'm making a prophetic declaration of his lordship and of his kingship and of his word into your life and over your life. I expect to see testimonies where people have received healing. I expect it. I, I expect that God was going to move because that's the God that I've come to know. That's the God that I serve. He's a God who heals. He's a God who changes hearts. He's a God who brings deliverance. So even now, if you're sitting here and you're addicted and you have cravings in your body for substance. You have cravings in your body for things that are polluting your body. Maybe you're addicted to cigarettes. Maybe you're addicted to alcohol. Maybe you're addicted to um, narcotics. I just want to speak right now in the name of Jesus that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I ask for the power and presence of God to be released into your life and to bring deliverance to you even now as you listen to this. Even now as you have the word of God God declared over your life, I speak that you're going to be healed, that you're going to be delivered, that Jesus is going to invade your life and your heart and move in such a way that your circumstances are going to change. I want to just speak um, that the Spirit of God would be stirred up in your heart. Those of you maybe have fallen into a lukewarm place where uh, you're not hot, you're not cold, but you're like the group in Laodicea where Jesus said, I wish you were one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I want you to speak that as Paul did over Timothy. I want to encourage you to fan the flame of God in your heart. Maybe you were on fire for Jesus a while back. Maybe you've had some bad experiences or you've let 
um, you know, a church committee or, or a pastor who, who shouldn't be in the pulpit, you know, hurt your feelings or, or, you know, or put you in another direction and you've just gotten bitter and you've just gotten turned off of the things of God. I just want to speak that the fan and the fire and the flame of God would be rekindled in your heart and your life, that you would be awakened to the things of God, that you would be awakened to the power and presence of God, that the Spirit of God would invade you as you lay your head down to sleep tonight, that he would pour out his spirit upon you, that you would get dreams and that you would have visions, that, that you would know him in an intimate, intimate way, that he would begin to reveal himself to you, that he would prompt you, that you would recognize his voice, that he would, he would through his spirit and his power and his presence, that he would draw you and give you a hunger and a desire for, for more of him. That that flame of God would be lit in your heart and your life. Look, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what was going on yesterday or what's been going on up to this point. But I just want to declare that even there would be a breakthrough in your relationship with the Lord, even today, moving forward. And, and I, you know, again, I, you know, maybe you've got a diagnosis from a doctor. Look, you know, the doctors say one thing, but God's word says another. God's word is the standard that dictates what happens or doesn't happen in our life. Okay? So again, I want to stand with you and I want to believe with you that, that Jesus can and will destroy those chains and those areas of your life. I also want to just read a passage of scripture to you here real quick and, and just declare this over you. And this is Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, speaking of Jesus, and uh, Jesus later quoted this. Uh, you can read about it in the New Testament. But it says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek and he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. Friends, I want to tell you that maybe maybe you're one of those. Maybe you're um, you know, broken hearted right now. Maybe you're bound. Maybe you're captive. Um, you know, maybe you're you're in a situation where where um, you know, the circumstance and situation is just overwhelming. Well, what I want to tell you is the word of God is true. And where we read in Psalms 107, 14, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their chains in pieces. Friends, Jesus didn't come just to save your soul. He came to radically and, and emphatically alter and change your circumstance in every single area of your life. So I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would receive that word, that you would receive faith, that faith would arise in you, and that you would see God move mightily and break through in whatever area or whatever chain that has you bound right now. Bless you guys. Hey guys, so we've made it to the second portion of the Impart Revival Minute. And this is basically the personal challenge part. This is where we try to take the scripture, we try to take the things that were discussed and dialogued about, and we try to apply them directly to our lives personally. We try to let the Spirit of God and His Word penetrate our hearts and meet us right where we're at. So maybe um, as I read this passage of scripture, and I'm just going to reread it again so we kind of backtrack to where we started he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their chains in pieces. So you say, well, you know, Damon, I've been a Christian for many, many years, and I still have this area of bondage, or I still have this trial or this chain, this thing that's weighing me down and hurting me. I, I still have this sickness right now that I'm dealing with and wrestling with, and maybe I've wrestled with it for years and years and years. And the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, Jesus actually even said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And, I mean, you can read Hebrews chapter 11, and although you see this uh, group of Christians and followers of the Lord who did some radically incredible, amazing things, you also see people listed in there that were literally thrown in prison, and they were cut in half, and they were tortured. 
And all of these people were still, you know, they were obedient to the Lord. They were uh, doing what the Lord wanted them to do. Look, I can't explain to you why certain things happen. I can't explain to you like the woman with the issue of blood. Well, she had that issue for 38 years. I can't tell you why that the the cripple at the pool of Bethsaida was, was there for his whole life. But what I can tell you is clearly something happened when they had an encounter with Jesus. Okay. And when they had this encounter with Jesus, God radically changed through Jesus a physical thing that was going on in their life. And I look, I'm convinced that, um, you know, it doesn't take much. You can read Fox's Book of Martyrs. You can see how the lives of the disciples, most of them ended. They were martyred. They were imprisoned. They went through all kinds of uh, pain and heartache and things like that. And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, a Christian life is easy. Actually, on the contrary, I think we're going to, the, the, the more that you're, um, striving after being obedient to the Lord and the more you're taking steps and faith and believing him and putting him first, I think that naturally you're going to be an enemy of this world and the world's going to hate you, Jesus said. But the truth of the matter is, I think there's a lot of times and a lot of places where um, Jesus wants to invade our lives and he wants to change something and he's just looking for us to turn our heart and our attention and our focus to him. Um, again, you know, none of the fact that, uh, there were people in Hebrews 11 that were tortured for their faith or they were cut in two or the disciples were martyred or people were sick for 38 years before Jesus intervened. None of that changes the fact that, that Jesus still heals today. He still delivers today. He still moves today. And, you know, I often use Lazarus as an example. Well, Lazarus eventually still died. But that particular time period, God used that as a way to show his power and his mercy and his awesomeness uh, to his disciples and the family that was there and even for us to read about today. So yes, there's going to be times where we're persecuted and we go through things. But guys, there's other times where God's going to want to move and his might and his power. He wants to bring his provision. He wants to bring his healing. He wants to bring all of his power to invade that circumstance and situation in your life. What I can tell you is as uh, you're maybe in that situation right now, maybe there's a sickness, maybe there's a trial, maybe there's an addiction, maybe there's a chain, maybe there's something that's got you bound in some area of your life that you need Jesus to radically get involved and intervene in that life. What I can tell you is also found in Psalms 107. And I just want to point out a couple scriptures to you here. We started with, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their chains in pieces. But I want to read you a couple other verses right around that. I want to see if you can hear a pattern here, okay? Verse 6 in 107 says, They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. Verse 13 says, And they cried unto the Lord of their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 19 in the cha same chapter says, They cried unto the Lord of their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 28 says, They cry unto the Lord of their trouble, and he brought them out of their stresses, their distresses and their troubles. Guys, I want to tell you that, that quite honestly, when we cry out to God and we plead to him and we reach out to him to intervene in our circumstance and in our situations, what I've come to know is that God responds. He responds to heartfelt repentance. He responds to a heart that's hungry for him, that's looking for him to intervene, that's looking for him to step down and get involved. It's like when we put off all of the other things and all of the other places that we're leaning on and all the other things that we're trusting on and we get to the point where we're desperate for, for God to move, when we get to a place where we're desperate for him and we're only seeking him and we're crying 
crying out to him. I'm telling you, when we get into a situation where, where he's the only option for remedy, he's the only option for deliverance, and we cry out and we make that declaration many, 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 many times, Jesus will step in, his word will be applied, and God will change our physical circumstance and our situation as we 100% look to him and put our faith and our trust and our hope and our belief in him and his word, he will step down. Friends, I just want to encourage you to declare the word of God over your circumstance. Even now, as you consider that trial, as you consider that bondage, as you consider that sickness, I want you to take the word of God and declare it over your life. I want to encourage you to find faith-filled people that will stand with you. The Bible says if one can rout a thousand and put a thousand to flight, two together can put ten thousand to flight. Look, there's a dynamic that comes when you stand with brothers and sisters in faith and you stand in agreement and you touch those things in agreement and you believe in agreement that God is going to intervene and do something. There's power that's released. There's faith that's, that's released into those circumstances. Friends, I just want to tell you, you can trust him. You can trust him to move. You can trust him to be faithful. Reach out to him. Cry out to him and ask him. Even now, even now, turn this off. Hit pause, whatever you got to do. Even now, that circumstance and that situation of the Spirit of God is stirring in your heart. That area that you need deliverance, that area that you need a breakthrough. I want to tell you right now, Stop listening to me and get on your knees, get on your face and cry out to the Lord that he would break through and intervene and watch and see what he does. All right, guys, so we've made it to the third and final portion of the In Part Revival Minute. And this is a section where I try to uh, provide to you additional resources to help you study whatever topic that we discussed. And I want to do something a little bit different. I want to actually, um, some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not, but I want to turn you on to a good reference book. This is something especially early on in my relationship with the Lord really, really helped me um, find uh, scriptures pertaining to whatever I was going through, whatever struggle, whatever issue, and that is a topical Bible. Now, one is uh, the Knaves topical Bible, um, pretty thick here, but I'm going to tell you why I like this. The reason I like this is, is it's not a bunch of commentary. You just look up the topic, and then it's going to list you all, all kinds of scriptures that deal with that topic. So look up sickness and you're going to have a ton, pages and pages and pages of scripture dealing with sickness. You look up depression, you look up um, fear, you look up anxiety, you look up addiction, you look up things like that. And a topical Bible is going to give you a ton of scripture. Again, going back to what I said earlier, it's the word of God that doesn't return void. I could give you referrals from book after book after book. But the truth of the matter is, it's not living, it's not alive, it's not active like the Word of God. So something like a Knaves Topical Bible could really, really help you learn Scripture. If you're not real familiar with a lot of Scripture and you don't know a lot of Scripture, get yourself a Topical Bible. Again, it's like a glorified index. It's got lists and pages and pages and pages of Scripture dealing with every kind of topic you could possibly want to research and look at. So again, there's other topical Bibles. Naves has been around for a long time, and I just uh, recommend to you to get yourself a topical Bible. The other book... Um, I want to just uh, refer to you, and because I referenced it uh, in the teaching uh, portion, and that is Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, if you look at this one that I, <laughs> I have, you're going to see that it's rather old. And truth of the matter is you probably can't even get one that is this old that looks like this. But there are a ton of varieties of Fox's Book of Martyrs available online and Amazon. Um, even um, uh, there's some that were designed for younger people a number of years back called Jesus Freak. 
And uh, it just, again, find yourself a Fox's Book of Martyrs. Try to find the complete thing and begin to read and study the stories of Christians that have uh, went before us and what they went through and what they endured. It'll really uh, put Christianity in perspective. Um, it really, again, um, you know, when you're looking at that group in Hebrews 11 and you're reading in these books the stories of Christians that laid down their lives for the sake of the gospel and you realize that they gave everything they had for the sake of the gospel, if nothing else, it should inspire you and it should give you um, a, a heart's desire to know the Jesus that they knew, to know and be so in love and affectionate with, with the Jesus that they, they knew that they were willing to lay down their life. So again, find yourself a Fox's Book of Martyrs and begin reading that. Um, it's broken down. The way it's broken down is just kind of story on story and you can read one uh, uh, you know daily you can read one a week but again i would encourage you to get a fox's book of martyrs so that's the recap uh nave's topical bible to help you study and then fox's book of martyrs as just a good perspective uh on the christian faith and some of the consequences and some of the things that maybe uh you might even be called to in the future as uh, the time draws closer when Jesus is coming. So God bless you guys. Hope it helps. If you would like to support the work of Impart Revival or the mission of Camp Esri to at-risk kids, or if you're interested in having Damon speak at your church, school, revival meeting, or a special event, please visit CampEsri.org or the Camp Esri Facebook page. Your gifts and prayers are appreciated as we continue our mission to radically preach the gospel and impart faith and a hunger for genuine revival.